welcome everyone here in the lecture hall as well as online. Uh, we have live streaming going on. Um, so welcome members of the TUD community and our Dresden concept partners who are also amongst us. And most of all, of course, our guest of honor, uh, Markus Schubert. So we live in technologically highly developed times and it's hard to imagine life without pharmaceutical products, fuels or plastic products. The production of all of these substances, uh, of course, requires deep conversion of materials, starting from raw products, um, turning them into the products that we know, from raw materials to products that we know. Now, m making these processes affordable, safe, and above all, climate neutral or environmental friendly, whatever term you prefer, these are great principles of modern production and process engineering. And you can imagine that based on this, we are facing major challenges. Here in Dresden, we are working to contribute innovative solutions to these processes and to changing towards sustainable and climate neutral production. Circular economy and recycling processes are the big buzzword behind which lie the networking of material and energy flows, the reduction of emissions and the processing of waste. In this context, the consideration of sustainable use of raw materials in process development as well as efficient separation and treatment processes to close cycles are essential. And this is exactly where chemical engineering comes in. Technology overcomes boundaries. This is the claim of the Faculty of Me Mechanical Science and Engineering, where the Chair of Chemical Process Engineering is located at the Institute of Process Engineering and Environmental Technology. This faculty, all of you know, is one of the important cores of our university since ever and it has been serving humankind with research and teaching for over 180 years. Besides technology, of course, it takes the right people. The right scientists to overcome boundaries, to be curious, stay curious, and become innovative. It takes scientists who live the claim and declare interdisciplinary research, interinstitutional, and international research collaboration to be their basic principle of action. Only together, by integrating resources and expertise, can we meet the challenges of our time. And I'm therefore more than pleased to welcome and introduce here today to you a researcher who lives this claim, who exemplifies this claim from his heart. Today, we welcome Markus Schubert, a chemical engineer who has been appointed to our university in September 2022. And on behalf of TUD community, I'm very pleased that we succeeded to bring you home, to bring you back to your alma mater. And why was this possible? It was possible because we are, as TU Dresden, embedded in Dresden Concept, in a Dresden Concept Alliance, in a Dresden Concept Science and Innovation Campus, which allows to forge exquisite scientific careers right here in Dresden. And of course, our talented people also leave Dresden, but then they can come back. And uh, Markus Schubert, is a great example for that. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to the Schubert family that is here with us in the lecture hall today. 
uh, to Inga Thor and the parents, uh, Edda and Gottfried Schubert, as well as the uh, sister and brother of Marcus. All of you, we welcome you to the TUD community as well as to the Dresden Concept Alliance community. Welcome, Markus Schubert. So now, turning to Markus Schubert and his scientific quest, um, one overarching question is how can we make chemical processes more sustainable and efficient? This is one of your crucial questions. And in today's, in your inaugural lecture, you will focus in particular on the question of how synthetic e-mobility fuels can make our future more sustainable. What are the necessary process chains? What are the challenges and solutions for a large-scale rollout of e-fuel production? His biography will be detailed later, I'm not repeating it. I would just like to mention this Dresden concept career path, which uh, led Markus Schubert from TU Dresden to a very successful career at the Helmholtz Centrum in Dresden, Rossendorf, with a short interlude in Quebec, Canada. And um, he has been a very successful ERC grantee, and he won a number of Helmholtz awards. And therefore, I'm extremely pleased now to hand over to Michael Beckmann, the dean of our Faculty of Mechanical Science and Engineering. He will highlight the strategic role of this professorship within his faculty. And afterwards, I'm also very pleased that Professor Uwe Hampe, the head of the Department of Experimental Thermal Fluid Dynamics at the Helmholtz Center in Dresden-Rossendorf, will present his laudatio on Markus Schubert. Unfortunately, he cannot be with us here in the room, but he sent us a video uh, which we will be able to watch. Many thanks, like always, for the people who made this event possible in the background. Christine Milkau, the Chief of Protocol, Caroline Meissner from the Faculty of Mechanical Science and Engineering, as well as the number of colleagues from our communication office here with us in the room is um, Frau Selbig, our colleague, and behind the screen watching the live stream are more colleagues present. Thank you to all of you. And don't forget we are meeting after the lecture and the Q&A downstairs to have a toast with our newly appointed member of the TUD community, Markus Schubert. And without much further ado, I'm handing over to Michael Beckmann. Please, Michael. Magnificenz, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, um, it's a big honor um, for us um, and especially for me today to welcome Markus Schubert in this um, uh, event of this uh, inaugural uh, lecture and also to address you, um, yeah, to welcome Markus here in this room and this lecture hall. Um, this is a very important professorship, not only for our faculty, but um, I think also for the TU Dresden uh, at all. Because um, with this professorship, um, yeah, we, we can make a link uh, between uh, disciplines. Yeah? Um, an old pharmacy joke says um, that um, it is not enough to know um, what about uh, the uh, black powder consists, yeah, to know that it's sulfur, salpeter, and uh, charcoal. It is also important to know in which boxes uh, the reagents, and you have also to know uh, the mixture uh, of this black powder. So, and um, to the um, chemical engineering or process engineering at all, um, a lot was said by our uh, rector already, uh, what it is. Um, 
I would say in uh, English, it is very easy to understand uh, process engineering or chemical engineering. Uh, in German, um, it is very difficult. Verfahrenstechnik. Yeah? What it is, uh, Verfahrenstechnik. Um, biology, chemistry, physics, that we know all from school. But what is process engineering? Yeah? That means um, in process engineering, the main issue is to design, to develop, to optimize uh, processes in an industrial scale. And uh, what is possible in the laboratory, um, it is not easy uh, and uh, not in, within a short time uh, transformable into the industrial scale. Often there are a lot of problems um, with um, the measurement, uh, with the uh, real scale and uh, with heat transfer and so on. And um, often also uh, good ideas, they fail in practice. So it's um, a very important uh, issue uh, to um, develop from ideas, from laboratory uh, into the uh, industrial scale. And that's why we think that this um, professorship is very important, uh, not only at our faculty, but also at the TU Dresden at all. The challenges of our time, they were already mentioned, uh, but um, let me focus on two uh, challenges uh, in particular. This is um, energy, um, uh, first of all, I think, and it is uh, also the material efficiency. We know that we have not so much uh, raw materials in Germany, also in Europe, yeah, there is not so much in feedstocks. And uh, that's why it is very important um, to go not only the processes from the feedstocks, from the raw materials, but also to recover valuable materials. And this uh, professorship of Markus Schubert is also a very crucial uh, professorship in this um, direction um, with regard to recycling, with regard to recovery of valuable materials, and uh, with regard to the circular um, uh, economy. Of course, all the technical and social challenges cannot be mastered by one professorship um, uh, and not by Marcus alone. And um, I should mention that process engineers, uh, they are team players. Uh, they work together. And um, I think, Marcus, that you will find um, a good um, field and a lot of opportunities in our institute, in our faculty at the TU Dresden and TU, uh, at uh, Dresden Concept at all. And um, um, let me mention um, uh, one uh, thing at the, uh, at the end. Um, I think the lecture today is um, focused on e-fuels. Um, this is, uh, I think, only one part of your work, Marcus, um, at, your, at uh, the uh, Institute. Uh, e-fuels um, are, let's say, on the end of the chain. Yeah? Um, a lot of things are already developed in this field. Um, it depends on the feedstock. It's a thin gas, first of all. It's hydrogen. What you need, it's uh, CO2. And uh, that's why you are, yeah, one can say, one brick uh, in this building um, of other um, colleagues uh, in our faculty in the TU Dresden. Um, they will provide the hydrogen, they will provide the CO2, but it is also important uh, that we look to uh, other things like measurement, sensors, and so on. And uh, that's why I think, or I'm uh, very convinced uh, that um, you will um, bring uh, a huge development in our faculty. I'm very pleased that um, yeah, it was possible for us to attract you, Marcus, uh, to come to Dresden, uh, TU Dresden uh, again. And um, I wish you all the best for your work together with us. Big success. Um, and um, yeah, for uh, today, I wish us um, a very nice event, a very nice lecture, I think, uh, concerning uh, the uh, person of uh, Marcus, we will hear 
um, in the next um, uh, speech from Uwe Hampel, um, everything what we need to know about you uh, concerning your scientific career. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I wish you all um, a nice lecture uh, this um, afternoon here and uh, a good discussion um, in uh, the evening. Thank you very much. Magnificence, Spectabilitäten, dear students, dear colleagues. I'm very pleased and at the same time I'm very honored to be able to open Professor Schubert's inaugural lecture today as a short laudation. Professor Schubert took up his position as a professor of chemical process engineering at the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering here at the University in Dresden in early autumn last year. And I can say that with Professor Schubert, the university and the faculty have truly gained an internationally renowned expert in the field of chemical process engineering. Professor Schubert studied chemical engineering and he completed his doctorate here at the University in Dresden in 2007. Afterwards, he became a research associate in the field of energy research at the Helmholtz Zentrum Dresden Rossendorf. From there, I have known him personally for about 15 years now, and I appreciate him as a very committed, a very versatile, and an internationally highly recognized scientist who has an excellent network in academia and industry. When he was with Helmholtz Zentrum Dresden Rossendorf, his field of research was the design and development of new systems and processes for catalytic multiphase reaction and for thermal separation. And with that, the development of experimental and numerical tools for the analysis of multiphase reactors. And all of that was with the aim of enabling energy and resource efficient operation of industrial chemical plants. I'm sure that many of you will ask now, so what is this all about? And I can tell you, please be patient, he will surely explain you in a minute in his inaugural lecture. Until today, Professor Schubert succeeded in an outstanding way in qualifying himself as an international expert in the field of chemical process engineering. In that, he was constantly seeking and promoting national and international scientific collaboration. And though he is still rather young, he is well connected and widely known not only in the German community of chemical engineers, but moreover also in France, in Italy, in Ireland, in the US, in Canada, in India, and in many other countries. Here are just two examples of his recent success story. In 2013, and that was shortly after his doctorate, Professor Schubert managed to acquire an ERC starting grant on the topic of analysis and modeling of turbulent bubbly flows. And this is not only a funded project, it's a truly renowned award from the European Union. Just recently, Professor Schubert could put a European training network on the use of hydrodynamic cavitation and chemical processing on the track. And here, Professor Schubert was a leading proposal writer. In today's inaugural lecture, Professor Schubert will address the exciting topic of chemical energy storage, if you like. As most of you will know, this topic represents a very much supporting pillar in the transformation of today's energy system. In an energy system, and especially in the German one, you have only very limited base load capability for CO2 free energy supply. And therefore, we urgently need technologies for converting electrical energy from wind power and photovoltaics into chemical energy carriers. And this, of course, includes the production of so-called e-fuels for the transport sector. So all of that is a great challenge, and that's exactly what engineers like. So as we will see this in a minute, 
it's an extremely attractive field for chemical engineers in the years to come. But at the same time, it's an incentive for young people to look for ingenious engineering solutions. So there's great time ahead, and now with Professor Schubert as an outstanding expert at this university. I'm now looking forward, as I'm sure you are, to learning from the expert himself about the future role of e-fuels, about the current state of science and technology for their large-scale production, and about new pathways and wishes. So, please enjoy it. Well, good afternoon. Yeah, I feel very honored, Rector Professor Staudinger, Dean Professor Beckmann, Professor Hampel, yeah, for this very kind introduction, for this laudation, for the opening of this event. Dear colleagues, students, my family, people online, very welcome to my inaugural lecture. Actually, I'm still a little bit overwhelmed, so, but I hope this, that, will be, uh, that will go away in the next minutes. So it's a very great day for me. It's very great to be here, um, to be back at Theo Dresden, at my alma mater, where I graduated more, almost 20 years ago, actually. Um, yeah, and at this time, it was impossible uh, to imagine that I would stand here one day. So thank you very much for the invitation, Professor Staudinger, for the opportunity to present here in this inaugural lecture, but also for the opportunity to present the discipline, the discipline of chemical process engineering and its contribution in a changing world. I'm aware actually that I guess I'm one of the very few persons presenting here in this inaugural lecture from an engineering discipline so far. And, well, I hope I can justify your invitation. Usually when I'm asked about my research field to explain what I'm doing in one sentence, just in a few words, then I respond, or I respond, it's about multiphase reactors or multiphase processes. Well, I'm aware that this sounds a bit old fashioned, maybe even a bit boring at first glance. So let me put it in the context of a changing world, of the energy transition. Just a few examples. Chemical recycling, chemical energy storage, chemical production based on renewables, means renewable energy, renewable feedstock. These are just a few examples, and they all depend on multiphase processes. So my opinion, these are core elements of the energy transition. However, today I wanted to make it a bit more comprehensive or comprehensible. And so it was coincidence that your team asked me if I could link my talk with the current debate about synthetic fuels in the context of a future mobility. Well, and this is the title of my today's lecture. However, I want to, to highlight, and Professor Beckman mentioned that already, that although I link my presentation with e-fuels today, mobility and e-fuels, please consider that in a much wider sense with the term synfuels, since they can be used for energy storage and for production in the chemical industry, of course. So, well, how to start? For me, the extra spice of such inaugural lecture is the interdisciplinary audience. With some of you are experts in this field, maybe even more than me, my family. And yeah, since a picture is more worth a thousand words, I was wondering what all, all of you would have in mind with this term e-fuel. And well, there's no time for a Q&A session right now. Uh, I tried to get a kind of swarm imagination based on a available collective knowledge. In other words, I took an AI software and tried to create some image 
with some prompts related to EViewers. Well, except maybe the upper one on the right, which is quite interesting, though emissions from a truck are used directly in another car with an implemented chemical plant. But I would say, yeah, artificial intelligence is still not really able to give a clear picture about EViewers. So, okay, then let's jump a little back, precisely 120 years. In 1903, Svante Irenius was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his research about electrolytic dissociation. And actually, I was not really aware of that. For me, he was more famous for his concept of the activation energy, an energy barrier that has to be overcome in order to let a reaction proceed. That's also some of the basic concepts in my chemical engineering classes, actually, in terms of selecting catalysts, uh, defining optimal temperatures. And what is less known is that he was one of the first researchers that tried to quantify the contribution of CO2 to the greenhouse effect. Actually, he was speculating whether variations in the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere could have contributed to changes long-term changes in the climate. However, contrary to some misunderstanding, he did not explicit, explicitly suggest that burning fuels would contribute to global warming, although he was aware that fossil fuels are a potentially significant source of CO2. So eventually he concluded, oh sorry, he concluded that there is a balance between all the processes which reduce CO2 from the atmosphere, formation of carbonates, and the processes with contrary effects, in other words, the release of emissions. And he also concluded if there's an imbalance between reduction and release, it's just a temporary uh, issue. Well, meanwhile, we know it's not so temporary, there's a strong increase of CO2 in the atmosphere, and yeah, it's a significant perturbation of the global carbon cycle, with all the consequences for global warming, of course. So as a consequence, the Paris Agreement was signed, we all know that, in order to limit global warming well below two uh, degree above the pre-industrial pre level. And at the same time, the IPCC has estimated the amount of CO2 that can still be released that's the carbon budget, that's the, actually the dashed area. And the IPC, IPCC has also suggested a pathway towards net zero emissions. However, what we can see, there's still an ongoing increase of CO2 emissions. And please ignore this little peak, this negative peak. This is just because of the COVID pandemic. So it's still increasing. So knowing this ongoing increase, it's clear that immediate actions would be needed. And somehow, this reminded me on a TED talk that I've seen a couple of years ago about procrastination while writing a thesis. And yeah, I hope some students are here. They have this experience with writing a thesis and the deadline. And we know this fight, this mental fight between panic monster, we have to do something, and the instant gratification monkey, which says, there is much time. So it's quite difficult to arrive, uh, to make good decisions to get things started. In terms of thesis writing, the later we start, the more workload we have a couple of days before the deadline. And it's somehow the same with the CO2 emissions. So the later we start to reduce, the more significant or the more disruptive will be the consequences for our society. However, we could be pessimistic. Let's keep with an optimistic mindset. And the CO2 emissions in Germany have significantly decreased over the last 30 years. However, we can also see that the sector of mobility, transportation, did not show the same decreasing trend and obviously faces challenges in order to cope with the net zero emission in 2045. So the question is, how can we decarbonize the mobility sector? And of course, we can reduce mobility we can shift from individual transport to public transport. 
but that will be not sufficient, it's clear. So we need technical solutions. And let me start with a very short classification of potential solutions in order to decarbonize the transportation sector. Of course, all are based on renewable energy that can be used either directly for electric drives with batteries or to split water into hydrogen, which can be used for fuel cells or further for synthesis towards e-fuels. It's clear in the future there will be a mixture, but today I would like to put the focus on the third options, the e-fuels. It's clear that different people take a different view, and I guess all of you are aware about the very emotional debates about e-fuels in the past months, with, as I would say, some misunderstandings, simplifications, of course, also lobbyism. However, today I would like to put the focus explicitly on the chemical and engineering perspective. But I would like to start with some facts about fuels. There are two big advantages for fuels. The first one, among all the energy carriers, they have the highest energy density. And this is the red bar for the um, liquid hydrocarbons. So fuels, regardless whether they are of fossil nature or synthetic, belong to this category. The second fact is that they can be kept in large mobile or stationary storage for a long time. So they have a huge storage capacity, long rollout time. In this way, they can, of course, contribute to energy security. Even so they get a signif significant importance even beyond the mobility sector. So what are e-fuels? Well, e-fuels are synthetic substitutes for fossil fuels such as gasoline, diesel, kerosene. They are also called drop-in replacements for a simple reason they can be used on a one-to-one -one basis in conventional combustion engines. And I would like to start with a kind of visual chemical reaction equation. So it's renewable electricity, it's water, CO2, which can be synthesized towards fuels. And since they are liquid at room temp temperature, the whole process is called power to liquid. So the generic production scheme starts with electricity generation. This is used for water splitting via electrolysis. And together with the CO2, then we have all the ingredients for the subsequent synthesis. And after some upgrading steps, we have E-fuels on one side for the mobility sector, that's just the, the used term, or thin fuel for the energy sector and the chemical industry. So, of course, each of the elements would justify an inaugural lecture or a lecture series. However, today I would like to put the focus on the synthesis, on the upgrading steps, and I would like to discuss the critical role of CO2 as a limited resource in the context of a circular economy. Well, looking on this scheme, probably you are wondering what's new. And you're right, the principles actually are very well known for decades. However, connecting these units in order to cover the demand for future, or to cover the future demand of e-fuels or synfuels based on renewable energy, and without a fossil component. These are the challenges. So basically we have two pathways. One is the methanol pathway, one is the Fischer-Tropsch pathway. And while going into the details, in particular for the Fischer-Tropsch pathway, please apologize, I cannot fully omit chemistry in the next few slides. So traditionally, the required synthesis gas, as Professor Beckmann already mentioned, it's hydrogen, carbon monoxide, is provided either via steam reforming based on natural gas using liquid hydrocarbons or via gasification of coal. So the question is, how can we get rid of this fossil component? And here, the reverse water gas shift reaction is one of the major options to revalorize CO2 in the context of a circular economy as a valuable raw material. 
Actually, the term reverse is a bit misleading since it is an equilibrium reaction. However, to shift the equi equilibrium towards CO, the carbon monoxide, it requires very high temperatures. And also, of course, to reduce byproduct formation. So, current research is about developing new catalysts, efficient catalysts with high activity, um, high stability in order, in order to overcome slow reaction kinetics. And of course, to reduce reaction temperature. Further, advanced reactors are needed for better temperature control and in situ removal of water. At least to my knowledge, despite all this research effort, there's no commercial reactor available for this reverse water gas shift reaction. The problem is, or to make it commercially feasible, it requires high amount of thermal energy at high temperature and sustainable resources or sustainable hydrogen at large scale. Of course, there are some other promising concepts like using co-electrolysis of uh, CO2 and water steam to produce the syngas. Um, and actually, we have quite some important players here in Dresden working on the solid oxide electrolyzer cells. So let's go to the process or the fischer tropsch process, um, which is the core element. It's well known for about 100 years, as you can see from the patent. It was developed at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Cold Research using syngas via cold gasification. By the way, this is today's uh, Max Planck Institute for Coal Research. Well, very soon it achieved great importance in Germany as it helped to cover the demand for liquid fuels and to provide the chemicals for chemical production, the raw material. Today, fischer tropsch reactors are in operation in so-called mega plants, as you can see here in this figure in Qatar. That's based on natural gas. In this reaction, syngas is catalytically converted using iron or cobalt catalysts to a variety of hydrocarbons with different chain lengths, depending on the operating condition, conditions. Actually, since no large-scale syngas production is available today, also the fischer tropsch reactors for these power 2L liquids, power, power PTL liquids, are rather small. These are container solutions. And in order to increase the capacity that's based on a kind of numbering up of these container solutions. There are also some possibilities, possibilities to use CO2 as a pure feedstock. Basically, that's the integration of the reverse water gas shift reaction into the fischer tropsch reactor. However, the development of the catalysts are still at a very early stage. So to make the process complete, eventually the long chains Paraffins are cracked into smaller components, separated via distillation, and then we have, yeah, basically the gasoline, the kerosene, and the diesel fractions, which can be used after some upgrading steps in conventional combustion engines. So I could now, of course, spend 10 more minutes in detailing the second pathway, which is the methanol pathway. To make it short, here also the synthesis gas is converted, is catalytically converted, to methanol that can be used as a platform chemical or further converted, and that's quite interesting, to various fuels or fuel additives. And here I would like to mention that colleagues in Saxony and Freiburg are actively working in this field and operate first pilot plants. Well, so far I've just outlined or explained the power to liquid process concepts, some aspects about the synthesis routes, aspects of catalysts, However, as a chemical engineer or reaction engineer, I've been always fascinated how such concepts eventually translate into reactor technologies, into hardware. And as you can see, many reactors or type of reactors have been developed and commercialized over the last years for methanol synthesis, for fischer tropsch synthesis. So the main challenge for all these reactor designs is to economi economically remove the reaction heat for these very exothermic reactions to avoid byproduct form formation, well, and to achieve, of course, high conversion rates at the least possible temperature, 
depending on the boundary conditions. So that brings me to my vision. Well, the vision is to provide each and every fluid element optimal conditions along its flow trajectory. What means optimal in the context of a chemical reaction? Well, it's the composition and the temperature at each partic particular place and moment in time in order to achieve the highest yield of the reaction. Well, in order to understand how this vision eventually can be realized, let me give you a brief schematic idea of the complexity of multiphase reactors. So here are just two types shown, and there are two options. Either the catalyst is immobilized on particles, scale of few millimeter, that are then dumped in tubes and surrounded by the uh, cooling liquid, or they are suspended in the liquid phase, which gives kind of slurry, um, which surrounds the cooling uh, tubes. So all this result in kind of multi-scale phenomena. So it's the convective flow with mixing patterns, characteristic uh, flow dynamics at smaller scale, interfacial heat and mass transfer between catalyst and fluid phases, diffusional effects in the catalyst, and of course, the reaction at the active sites at the smallest scale. So this vision eventually results, I would say, in a well-balanced recipe of optimal catalyst structures, optimal reactor design, and of course, optimal operating conditions. And all, this, all these optimal conditions are selected based on experimental analysis, based on numerical studies. So let me give you an example. So such a bubble, com bubble column reactor is conceptually one of the simplest multiphase reactors. And it's used for PTL processes, of course. So how does it work? Liquid is introduced at the bottom, uh, gas, sorry, gas is introduced at the bottom and rises in a more or less chaotic manner through the liquid phase, as you can see here, see here in this magnifying lens. Of course, in reality, we have organic liquids with low surface tension, we have small particles, catalyst particles, we have heat exchanger internals, so that the whole system becomes fully opaque and optical observations accordingly would fail. So in order to, to resolve the flow structure and basically to understand um, how it affects heat and mass transfer, chemical reaction, we have applied non-invasive imaging technique, namely fast X-ray tomography, that you can see here, and radioactive particle tracking. And this was for the first time that both techniques were applied for identical reactor configurations in order to, let's say, complementary track the dispersed gas structures and the liquid phase. So in this way, we have not only created a unique benchmark that can be used for development of numerical models, CFD, computational fluid dynamics. We have also analyzed, for example, how dispersed gas clusters in bubble swarms, how it pushes liquid circulation and intensify heat and mass transfer. We have also identified heat exchanger configurations used for internal cooling that are geometrically difficult since they induce internal slug flow, which deteriorate uh, heat transfer. And the third example, we have provided evidence of a kind of counterintuitive particle effect with regard to stabilization and destabilization of the flow. So it's a competition between particle-induced pseudo-viscosity on one side and increasing particle bubble interactions on the other side. So what have we done with the results? Of course, we have compiled them or translated into engineering correlations that can now be used for reactor design and process modeling. So when I prepared the presentation, actually I was about to stop here. So I've shown the advantages of e possible pathways, and also tackled uh, some engineering aspects for reactor design. However, I had the feeling that I would miss one particular aspect. And you can easily imagine 
using e-fuels e in combustion engines, yeah, you produce, again, CO2 emissions, of course. So the question is, how can we close the carbon cycle? And at the beginning, while detailing the synthesis, I spoke about revalorization of CO2. So the question is, how can we provide the CO2 for the synthesis? And actually, there we have two options. One is to use CO2 from point sources, such as cement, steel, ammonia production, where CO2 can be hardly avoided. So then at least CO2 would get a second kind of use case. To be fully carbon neutral, of course, then we should take CO2 from biomass or separate from biogas. However, there are critical discussions about the extensive use of biomass. That's why I'd like to put the focus on a second option, which is called direct air capturing. In simple words, CO2 is just released to the atmosphere, and then the same amount is separated again and reused for production of e-fuels. So how does direct air capturing work? In short, there are two, two periods, the capturing phase, where large fans draw in the air and filters with engineered chemicals bind physically or chemically the CO2. In the second phase, when the filters are occupied, they are heated up and release the concentrated CO2. And meanwhile, there are some uh, commercial partners that provide such solutions at very large scale, actually. Well, um, we always claim that CO2 concentration is too high in the atmosphere, and no doubt it is too high. But when it comes to air, direct air capturing, um, well, we see that the concentration in the atmosphere is four magnitudes smaller compared to industrial emissions. And that has a consequence. The demand, the energy demand to separate the same amount of CO2 from the atmosphere is about 10 times higher. And that's actually a kind of dilemma because this energy has to be renewable as well. So it's not only the hydrogen production via electrolysis, it's also the CO2 separation. And considering the expected demand for future e-fuel production for CO2 and hydrogen, that by far exceeds today's capacity. So for this reason, I guess it's not so surprising that the former idea of desert tech, and I guess most of you know the desert tech idea, gets a kind of revival. I mean, initially, the idea was to transmit cheap and renewable energy from Middle East, Northern Africa, to Europe. Meanwhile, however, there are first e-fuel projects that are realized in regions, in remote regions, with abundant amount of energy. And this is just an example in Patagonia, Chile, where they use wind energy here at this uh, high magnitudes of wind, wind in order to produce hydrogen. Just a side note, still they use CO2 from a brewery, but they promised to later switch to direct air capturing. Well, there are also other initiatives that rely on solar and wind energy with offshore e-fuel production in maritime environment. So far, these are just concepts, so these are not photographs, these are just uh, some graphical illustrations. However, it's quite likely that they will be realized in the next years. Here, reactors will be embarked on mobile offshore platforms next to the places of energy harvesting. And that actually opened a new field for research on multiphase reactors. So as a chemical engineer, we were wondering, well, what or how does ship oscillation and ship tilt triggered by wind or sea swell affect the performance of multiphase reactors for the production of e-fuels? And in order to mimic sh uh, this ship motion, we have analyzed the performance of several multiphase reactors using hexabot robots with a six degree of freedom motion. And to make it short, I guess it's not surprising that an update of all these former correlations was needed in order to account for stormy weather. So coming back to my research topic, which, as I mentioned, sound a bit old-fashioned maybe at first glance, I hope I could give you at least an idea that multiphase reactors are much more than test tube chemistry or constructing of large steel vessels. 
So, and that they are a fascinating element of the energy transition. Well, so far I have kind of circumnavigated the answer to my initial question. Are e-fuels a promise for the future mobility? Well, let me show one graph from a very recent study. Here, all the globally announced e-fuel projects are shown and their capacity is uh, estimated. Still, it's unclear if they will be realized, so there's no investment decision. But let's again take an optimistic mindset and, yeah, we assume that they will be realized until, 2000, until 2035 with full capacity. Well, then they provide about 5% of the amount globally compared to the demand of Germany based on numbers from 2019. Of course, these are just numbers from 2019. They will also change. However, I guess it's clear there's still a huge discrepancy. So coming back to my initial question, I think, yes, I have no doubt actually, e-fuels or thin fuels will become increasingly important, also for the mobility sector. However, with a more or less clear priority to sectors where they are unavoidable, like shipping, long distance flight, and utilization in the chemical industry. So eventually, supply and demand, of course, will decide on the future significance of e-fuels in the individual mobility sector. With that, I would like to finish my little inaugural lecture. I'm quite sure that this topic has sufficient potential for further, even emotional discussions, even beyond the chemical engineering perspective. So I would like to take the opportunity, of course, for some acknowledgement. First of all, of, of course, I'm very thankful for the funding that I received over the last years. I, like, I would like to acknowledge the work and the hard work of my former colleagues at Helmut Zentrum Dresden Rossendorf, now my new team here at Theo Dresden. I'm very thankful that I got the chance to join Theo Dresden um, in September last year as a professor for chemical process engineering. In particular, I would like to acknowledge that I became immediately a member of the Theo Dresden Circ Econ team, thanks to Professor Modler thanks to Professor Beckmann, which is, as it's written, a joint research center for circular product and material economy. In simple words, we want to convert waste to valuable products. And with my chair, we want to contribute in the conversion of waste to fuels or hydrocarbons, where the challenge is the changes in the composition of the waste, as well as variations in the supply of energy. With that, I want to thank you all for coming. Very, I thank you very much for the organization, for the whole team that was involved in organization. Well, and I give the word back to Professor Beckmann. And I'm happy to take any question you have. Yeah, Markus, uh, thank you very much for this um, really interesting presentation which gave us an, uh, at a glance a view into the scientific um, challenges and uh, needs for the development of e-fuels and uh, also uh, a little bit a few concerning the um, yeah, needs and uh, the discussion uh, in the society. So I'm sure uh, that there are a lot of questions and um, it's up to you now here in the auditory to raise some questions to Marcus, please. First one is difficult, but we have a first one from uh, Professor Breitkopf. Um, we have also a micro here, please. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. I would raise uh, I would like to raise two comments. Uh, the first one, Svante Arrhenius did actually really predict correctly the uh, global warming potential of CO2 based on the works of Tyndall. He did it. So okay. he, he said really three to five Kelvin. Uh, so he did it really. Uh, and the second, I would like to raise um, maybe a critical discussion of this if you words with respect to the transformation of society. So. It implies we only need to switch from one fuel to another to uh, get away from all the problems which are there. Why do you put still the focus on mobility? Is it really the, the way where we should think about only mobility? Because a car would produce the same amount of dust from the friction of the tires, which is making environmental problems. A car needs to produce, it is aluminum, it is very energy expensive. Yeah? So that's why um, in view of the whole transformation, it should be made um, a comment that only switching from one fuel to another is maybe not the solution. This would be my opinion. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you're right. There's, there's no doubt. Uh, and e-fuels will be, of course, not the solution. Um, I also, when I talked about how can the mobility sector be decarbonized, my first comment was reduction of mobility, um, new mobility concepts. And I guess it can be just one part to use e-fuels for sectors where it's absolutely unavoidable, but that's of course not the, the only option, no doubt. Mm -hmm. And I want to mention, you mentioned that he already quantified, Arrhenius quantified the global warming. Um, I didn't show it, but it was in one of my draft slides that there was also in the 1980 uh, report of uh, Exxon, where they very, very precisely estimated the global warming, and that was actually scaring. So it was uh, hidden, this report, for a couple of years, but yeah. Yeah, yeah I know, <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, then if there is another question. So, um, yeah, maybe a question from my side. It's a little bit connecting also to this, what uh, Professor Breitkopf asks. Um, not only to focus on uh, the mobility, but you mentioned it, uh, I think, in your uh, lecture, in your presentation, that um, e-fuels, um, this is only one um, uh, thing, the other thing is uh, synthetic, if we, we call it synthetic fuels, then uh, we are uh, in the field of storage. And uh, I think this is, to my mind, this is very important that we have also uh, storage capacity within this uh, fluctuating uh, energy system for the future. And uh, that brings me to my question. Um, you mentioned that all these processes are um, well known from, uh, from the past and there are a lot of patterns uh, in the fossil world, but uh, there we had uh, continuously um, production, uh, so not to, uh, we are not faced with uh, fluctuating uh, energy. So, is it? Uh, uh, do you think that this is an, uh, still also a uh, big challenge to adapt the processes to fluctuating energy input? Yeah, I guess that's one of the major issues. It could be an advantage that for Fischer-Tropsch uh, processes, the reactors are smaller, maybe are better to control in terms of temperature. Uh, control. Um, actually, I have doubts about reverse water gas shift reaction at flexible operation mm -hmm. because that's at high temperature and yeah, making high temperature process flexible is, I guess, very challenging. But this is indeed a topic. And, and okay, uh, do you see in the future that uh, it would be possible to, to come from the this uh, large-scale reactors, yeah, if we, we know it from the raffination process, yeah, if you drive at the A38, there is Loina, big la or large-scale facilities for uh, the, the raffination. Do you think that in the future uh, we will have small and modular reactors? At least at for the coming year. Decentralized? Yeah, for the coming year, I guess it will be decentralized reactors, it will be container solutions, um, okay. And as soon as more energy is available, syngas production is available, is available, then it would be kind of numbering up procedure to increase the capacity. But okay. I cannot imagine such 
huge uh, fissile drop reactors mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. the one in Qatar for power to liquid processes. And uh, Maybe one day what do you think how far away we are from this uh, solution that we have, uh, let's say, the first modular reactor here at our campus at TU Dresden? Maybe we also have this agenda to be uh, CO2 free in uh, 35, I guess. Uh, so <laughs> maybe this could be a solution. <laughs> well, at least on a research base, I hope that will happen soon. So we have some mm -hmm. hopefully good plans for Cirque Econ yeah. To, okay. yeah, to run one of these possible pathways. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm looking here into the auditory. Okay, there are questions, Professor Staudinger or for Meissner, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very good lecture and overview. I was wondering from the start about the energy efficiency of these processes, because on your first uh, very nice graphical slide, you saw the energy source, uh, and then it had to go to, through two more steps, uh, so you can just, even as a layperson, imagine that you lose out on impact. Yeah. Um, so how does that figure into the equation? Um, there are some estimations about kind of energy efficiency, so starting from how much energy, or with how much energy we start, towards the energy of the fuels at the end. And it's, I would say, between 40 and 55% is the overall efficiency. Um, it's a little bit higher for the methanol pathway compared with the uh, fischer tropsch pathway. But essentially, it, depend, it depends on the CO2 source. So if it's direct air capturing, that reduces the efficiency. Yeah, it also requires a lot of energy for the separation. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is another question, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Schubert, for the nice presentation. Um, my question, is, well, maybe let's first comment. I'm very happy that you raised these numbers in the end about the worldwide expected, optimistically expected production versus what we use in Germany alone. And also if you show the process industry and what the process industry uses. And if you want to go carbon neutral, we have to like address process industry in example as one, yeah, one, one um, area which takes the production from that. My question is now, if we see these numbers, um, it's hard to imagine that we get fastly there that we can like provide uh, process industry with, with uh, carbon neutral um, edacts resources for production. Are there any like breakthroughs around the corner or technologies which could change this picture heavily? Because I think we have to change this heavily um, to proceed actually that path. Well, actually comparing these two paths that I have shown, which shows the discrepancy, that was also a bit frustrating at first glance, but at the end, it depends on energy. So, to my opinion, the techniques are there. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there are improvements or possible improvements for, for efficiency, but in general, the techniques are there. It's a question of energy and maybe energy harvesting at remote places. I mean, I'm not sure if this is a solution in Germany, but on a global scale, I guess, yeah, it can, can work. But will take time, so, and that's what I'm also a bit Pessimistic. Thank you, Professor Schubert. Thank you, Professor Schubert. Um, now to something completely different. You talked about your vision as chemical engineer the, to optimize the trajectories of every fluid element. Can you explain in more detail what does it mean and how can we achieve this? Well, first of all, it's a vision. <laughs> and um, 
it, it can be done based on theoretical models to predict, of course, for a certain pathway of a reaction um, in various reactor configuration, the optimal uh, condition that we should realize. Of course, there are technical limitations because, um, of course, we can say that we want to increase in a certain step temperature from 20 to 200 degree, but there are technical limitations. So division is the optimum and it has to be combined with, let's say, the technical possibilities. And the pathway is based on yeah, mainly numerical analysis in terms of flow using computational fluid dynamics as an example. Okay, some more questions. Yeah, they are in the, in the back, please. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Schubert, for your presentation. I really liked it. Um, you mentioned like the problem of carbon capture, and you also mentioned that we might use uh, renewable energy from remote locations to produce these e-fuels or synthetic fuels. Uh, since the, the carbon capture is a major uh, like source that we need to, to get, I wondered what you think about different pathways like power to ammonia as a potential synthetic fuel. Mm -hmm. um, there are different, different approaches to that, and I think nitrogen is a more abundant source. I wanted to get your opinion on that pathway to use renewable energy as an energy vector, for example. Yeah, I guess e-ammonia could be a third solution. Maybe it will be not the solution for the mobility sector, but the good thing is with ammonia, there are established routes for transportation, so yeah, I guess there, there will be several reasons why also ammonia is a very important uh, pathway. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there some more questions? So I have uh, one question from my side. Uh, um, you mentioned uh, CO2 and uh, the, um, yeah, the, um, uh, uh, direct air capture, and this is very uh, energy expensive. Yeah. Uh, so if we look to the other processes, you mentioned it's a cement uh, process, also biomass combustion, and uh, last but not least, uh, the um, combustion processes in thermal waste um, uh, treatment, maybe also from uh, the treatment of uh, carbon um, uh, 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 fibers, for instance. So, but. There are still um, poisons, uh, some uh, um, uh, um, yeah, uh, elements like sulfur and so on. Um, what, is, uh, what are the demands concerning the um, uh, uh, purification of these gases, uh, what you need uh, for your processes not to poison the catalysts? Of course, the cleaner the better. Okay. And um, yeah, as soon as we, for example, use waste as the origin with its thermal uh, treatment to produce um, CO, CO2, um, syngas basically, that will create new challenges and I guess there's, that's still a huge field for, for research. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of catalyst development, so how stable they can um, yeah, counterbalance or how they, they um, work with uh, impurities. It's really difficult because that's a huge flower of different um, substances that can be within the syngas. Okay. I guess that will requir require so a lot of research, actually. Thank you very much. This is nice to hear <laughs> <laughs> for our work uh, together. Thank you very much. So um, I see there are no more questions, um, and uh, we have discussed it. Uh, not sufficiently, I think, but uh, now we should come to an end for this uh, inaugural uh, lecture here. I thank you, uh, Marcus, for this uh, nice presentation, for this lecture very much. Uh, thanks to you, to the auditory for um, questions. And um, now, um, yeah, we have an, uh, also a nice event uh, because the denomination was uh, changed uh, from 
Uh, maybe you know it was an open topic uh, professorship. It was uh, offered as an open topic professorship in process engineering. Uh, so it was not uh, directly um, offered concerning uh, chemical reaction uh, process. And now uh, we, are, we have the opportunity, um, uh, Professor Staudinger, um, and to hand over uh, yeah, uh, this new denomination to Markus Schubert, please. So that you all uh, hear what's written here, I will do this in German because the uh, Urkunde is in German. Uh, hiermit wird Professor Dr. Ing Markus Schubert gemäß Paragraph 60 Absatz 1 des Sächsischen Hochschulfreiheitsgesetzes mit Wirkung vom 25. April 2023 zum Professor für chemische Verfahrenstechnik an der Technischen Universität Dresden umberufen. Und das unterschreibt die Rektorin im Mai. 23. Herzlichen Glückwunsch für vielen die Dank. richtige Denomination und vielen Dank für eine tolle Vorlesung. Danke schön. Herzlichen Dank. Herzlichen Dank. Sehr gerne. Danke. Davor? Ja. Jetzt ein Kabel verdecken. Now let's have a toast. Please join us downstairs and congratulate uh, Markus for his great lecture and all the research to come. Thank you. <laughs>